Welcome to Resumes, Recruitment, and Interviews by Regan Perrin, brought to you by the Professional Women's Group of Dress for Success Kingston. I do want to introduce myself a little bit more formally for those that maybe haven't had a chance to connect with me one-to-one. -one. Um, so my name is Regan, of course. Uh, I'm a Senior Talent Acquisition Partner for TD Bank. Um, I've been in that role for almost two years. I've definitely seen some progression in my time in roles. I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of resumes and I've talked to and continue to talk to people on the daily. Um, I would say I probably conduct anywhere from about seven to eight interviews plus a day. Um, yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> um, I would say that um, this workshop and, and what we're looking to do, you have to be very mindful that it's not a one size fits all, right? There's not, as much as I can give you a template or, or a guide, um, at the end of the day, it is really tailored to you and what you do well and what you like to do, but also what you're applying for. Um, before I started in talent acquisition, I worked as a manager of customer experience for TD for about four years. Um, and, and prior to um, being in the management chair, I started as a customer experience associate. So basically started entry level, um, I performed day-to-day -day transactions, I helped customers and greeted them as they came in. Um, so that's a little bit about my professional quote-unquote resume for, uh, for you folks here. Um, before all of that good stuff, I worked in the service industry. Um, so I worked at the Iron Duke, if anybody's been there, it's a really nice place. <laughs> The Iron Duke, okay. and I've worked at Lone Star, uh, Toast and Jam, so um, some really, really great places that gave me a lot of um, different exposure and transferable skills that kind of helped me climb up to where I am today. Um, I do believe that it is very important that everybody at some point in their life in some capacity works in the service industry so that we all have an appreciation when we go out for a nice meal and, uh, and it's extremely busy at 5.30 and, <laughs> and they're short stopped and all of that good stuff. Um, it is always good to have that appreciation and understanding. Now, um, while I was serving, um, I was also in university and I would come home to, to save some money to be transparent and stay at my parents' house. It was really nice. They let me sleep in their basement for a very short period of time. It was just for the summers and then out you go. Um, and when I came home, I was rampant on Indeed. Monster jobs, um, you know, internal websites, Glassdoor. I was constantly looking and applying for jobs. Maybe a little bit too much. Um, and so this is kind of where I started learning. I will tell you a very embarrassing story so you can spare your own out loud. Um, but when I came home one summer and stayed in my parents' basement, I was going through Indeed, going through all these different tabs, applying everywhere, everywhere and anywhere under the sun because I needed a job. I needed money. That makes sense. I'm going to apply everywhere I can. I didn't change my resume. Um, I uh, didn't really read most of the descriptions on the website, to be honest with you. And that definitely showed, um, <laughs> definitely showed. Um, most embarrassing actually was my parents, oh, because it was their home, they got a voicemail from the Cirque du Soleil. They were looking for me. <laughs> and, and my parents were like, what is happening? You're in your undergrad, you need to finish school. Why are you literally dropping out and joining the circus? And I was like, no, no, it's just a summer thing. And then they were like, like, what role did you even apply to? And then I started asking myself, good question. What did I apply to? And the answer was, I had no idea. I had no idea. And then I started looking through um, everywhere I had applied on these websites, started to ask myself, like, why am I doing this? Paycheck, right? And then I had to think about, what am I good at? Well, not good at a whole lot of things, right? I was a language student. Um, math wasn't my forte, for example. There were certain fields that I, I felt um, aligned more with my skill set or, or what I could offer at the time. And so I thought, okay, I like people. I like helping people, and I like chatting. And I was like, the service industry, it's perfect. <laughs> I'll, I'll join, I will, I'll get into it, it's easy for the summer. And so that obviously progressed, made some really, really good tips. Fortunately, Lone Star had me back, I didn't get fired, <laughs> and then it just, the ball kept rolling from there. Um, so really embarrassing story, but I think the moral is, is there needs to be intention and there needs to be the why, right? Absolutely. As a recruiter um, for a larger organization, I'm privy to obviously seeing now the other side of the lens, right? I've been a candidate, 
I've, I've recently been a candidate, I've been internal candidate, external candidate, and now I'm a recruiter. And now I get to see what happens behind like the, the, the curtain, right? The Wizard of Oz, if you will. Um, and so what I've began to see is those people that are mass applying, right? Like me, back in the day, sending stuff out here, sending it over there. Right, so as a recruiter, I get to see this, that uh, Reagan has applied to 50 jobs and she's only qualified for two of them. <laughs> the other three, she doesn't live there. And so we go down the list, right? So I think that brings us full circle to say, we need intention. It is a lot about self-awareness and that can be really, really difficult, right? It, it's hard when you're put on the spot, kind of like right now, <laughs> but it, it's hard when you're put on the spot in an interview to say, I'm really good at X, right? Who's comfortable with that? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody right now? Right. So it does, it takes a lot of practice. A lot of the interview isn't actually the interview. It's what you do before the interview. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about resumes. We're going to talk about templates. We're going to get a little bit into interviews and we'll definitely get together and maybe do some samples and things like that. Um, so again, a little bit about myself. Um, embarrassing story or two and hopefully maybe that'll change your mind over the rest of the presentation here. I like mantras, I like quotes, I like sayings. Um, it's a little bit cheesy, so just stay, stay on the ride with me here. But there is one that I heard very recently um, from a fellow recruiter. Um, I believe it's actually a Benjamin Franklin quote. Um, but if better is possible, good is not enough. So that's something that you can literally copy, paste, apply to very many different facets of your life. But when we're thinking about, hmm, maybe I'm in a current position actually now, that's good pay is good, but I feel like I could do better or I feel like I could do something else. Um, so this is, this is one I'll, I'll leave with you and we'll probably come back to that a little bit later on for sure. Okay, so resumes, the bones, the bare bones, <laughs> right? So when we look at a standard resume, what are we looking at? We're looking at name, contact information, literally, who are you? How can I get a hold of you? Education, so education could be certificates, diplomas, it could be um, maybe just a couple of courses that you've done. Maybe you haven't finished your diploma, but maybe there's some rele relevant transferable skill sets you have from a course that you've taken. And then of course experience, whether it's paid or unpaid and both are equally valued. It is all dependent on how you express yourself and how you tell your story. Optional, a lot of these are urban legends. <laughs> a lot of people here might look at this side and say, Reagan, what are you talking about? You always need to write an objective in your resume. Wrong. You absolutely do not. Um, truth be told, and, and maybe a question that I'll ask you is, how long do you think it takes for a hiring manager or recruiter to look at your resume? 30 seconds on average. Yeah. 30 seconds on average. So what does that... What does that tell us? What does that put the main points like right away at the top mm -hmm. so they can know right away, oh, she's, she's really good at that. Yeah. Oh, she's got experience at that. Absolutely, 100%. Recruiters read top to bottom, left to right. Priority and relevant information always needs to go to the top. Yep. So when we're thinking about, and again, intention. What are you applying to? Why are you applying to it? You need to know these things before you just click send or you go drop off a resume. You need to know these things. Um, that'll tell you what comes first, right? And we'll go through templates and we'll, we'll kind of work through that. But templates can be molded differently, right? It's, it's the core information that needs to be the takeaway, but it needs to be something that in 30 seconds I can look at it. I know who you are. I know where you live. I know where you've worked. I know um, what type of candidate would you be, and I know if you meet the requirements of the position that I'm looking for, all in 30 seconds. Sounds a little bit overwhelming, and uh, there's another one that I heard. It's, um, if you're not uncomfortable or frustrated applying for jobs, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit bittersweet, but it, it is the truth. It, it is the truth, and actually, it goes for me as well, looking for people for jobs as well. If it's not frustrating, you're doing it wrong. Um, so yeah, so very important to your point, totally agree. Everything that's really important needs to go to the top. So if it's a position where 
Um, maybe education isn't necessarily a prerequisite or requirement. Maybe you'll put your work experience first. And you'll put your education at the bottom, right? Just depends on what you're applying to. So let's look at some of the optionals. So objective or pro professional summary. It's an objective. It's an objective for a reason. It's not supposed to be a novel. It's supposed to be maximum, maximum, like three sentences, right? What, remember the intentions. What are you looking to do? A little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background that explains why you are applying to this position. Skills or summary of qualifications. Um, this one's a really good one for individuals who might not necessarily have a lot of work experience, right? Practical work experience. But what are your skills? What, what, what's the summary of your qualifications? What can you do? Maybe, maybe you've done a lot of school and you haven't had the chance to do a lot of work. Right? So let's think about the skills that you have built in different group projects or um, presentations. And so that does lead into some other things as well too. Right? If you don't have that experience, what else can you kind of put in there that you can relate to what you're applying to? Leadership, community service, um, different initiatives, references. References. That's another one that some folks would be like, Reagan, like, what are you talking about? I always write references available upon request at the end of every resume I print out. Why? Why are we doing that? What, do, what, does that, what does that mean? How many people have actually, out of all the interviews you've had, how many people have actually had their references called? I had some calls during the, like, out of the interviews yeah. I've had. Yeah. yeah. Very, very rarely. Yeah. It is rare, yeah. Yeah. It's good to have them. I'm not saying don't have them. Please have them. Yeah. <laughs> Please have their contact information and not just having their contact information, but they need to know that they are your reference, right? There's nothing worse than a recruiter calling somebody that you list as a reference or, or later sent as a reference. And I say, hey, Mary, uh, I had an interview with, uh, with Joanne and uh, she worked with you for, you know, 11 months at, uh, at uh, Walmart. And, Tell me a little bit about her. Would you recommend her for this position? Oh, Mary, Mary who? Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's very uncomfortable, right? So you wanna make sure that the references, who can be a good reference? I'll tell you right now, your uncle Steve is not a reference. He's your family, <laughs> okay? <laughs> very, very important. If you worked in a family business, okay? This is a tricky example, but if you worked in a family business, which a lot of people have, right? We're in Kingston, small community, a lot of small businesses. I think that's great. Who else from that business or that structure can you use as a reference that, that's not your uncle Steve? So let's and think. You let them know, well, you know, I used your name as a reference. And then they're like, oh, okay, thanks for letting me know. Now I'm expecting it. Yeah, yeah. And you, you even want to do that before, yeah, right? Before yeah. you even submit them. Um, so that's, that's one to think about. Availability is something I actually love. I love that. When yeah. somebody is applying for a part time job, and I'm looking at a branch that has extended hours, okay? Some nights it's open until eight o'clock, some nights it's open till six. We have Saturday, Sundays that the branch is open. Okay, let's say we're guaranteeing anywhere from 15 to 20 hours a week. I'm gonna ask this question in the interview anyways. The manager's gonna ask you this question in the interview anyways. I love, I love when people put their availability on there. You can see it black and white, plain and simple, because what I find is in, in a lot of the interviews that I've done, availability is a very um, unorganized answer sometimes, to put it very nicely. Um, people know when they're available until a recruiter asks them, and then they, they just kind of forget timelines and things like that, or, or travel time, right? They're like, well, you know, my class ends at three. Um, okay, so the branch is open until eight, so what time can you get to the branch? You need to work a minimum of three hours, right? So we're going through this process. So, if you have your availability outlined, you're applying for part-time work, amazing. Or if you're even applying to f for full-time positions, but maybe they have overnights or, you know, maybe they have weekends or something that um, might not be so standard, that's fantastic. I love when, I love when candidates do that. Um, and then research. So if you've participated in any research projects, again, for, um, for school or for extracurriculars, um, that's always a good one as well. Again, all optional. There's no right or wrong. This is the meat and potatoes. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. As we've kind of loosely discussed these, maybe we could kind of table some of those if you have questions about particulars later on. Um, I will say 
with respects to community service and leadership. Um, it is really nice that you volunteered for the, uh, for the food bank nine years ago, one time. <laughs> it needs to be consistent, right? I think that's great and I don't discount the people that do that because, hey, listen, I've done tree planting days for once a year. Did we have them during COVID? No. Are they on my resume still? No. <laughs> but again, you just, you just have to think of how relevant is this information, right? How much value did that food bank or food drive that I did once nine years ago, how, what is the value of that for the job that I'm applying right. to? What is, what is the value, right? Is it worth me putting on the resume when in 30 seconds I need to make a really good impression on paper? Okay, name and contact information. This definitely sounds straightforward, right? Who you are, first and last name. Um, sometimes it's really nice if you wanna include your pronouns or if you have a uh, preferred, legal, or, uh, preferred name versus your legal name. Sometimes that's really nice as well too if you want to include that. Gone are the days of putting your, your street address. Gone are the days. Um, if you wanna just include the city, then that's fine. I don't need to, to know exactly where you live. I'm not gonna drive by your house, nor should I. So um, I, I don't necessarily need your street address and all of that stuff. If it's necessary at the time of a potential offer, I might ask you just for your HR employee information, but otherwise, you know, stay at home, do what you do at home, and then come to work and do what you do at work. <laughs> um, include one phone number and a professional email address. Professional email address. Professional email address. I don't want the email address that you give to Bath and Body Works every time you go in and it's Christmas and they're giving away free stuff and you're using it as a spam email. Um, I've seen all sorts of email addresses and it's actually made me even question my own um, if, it's, if it's professional or not. It can just be very simple. It can be your name at gmail.com or it can be a combination of uh, you know, your favorite numbers in your name or something like that. But let's keep it very, very simple. If you wanna have a spam email for um, solicitors or forever it may be, I have one. I don't even remember the password for it, but I, I, I do give it away from time to time when people ask and I feel like I'm put on the spot but I do have my professional email that I use reoccurring day to day. Something very important to be mindful of. The other thing about the emails that I will say is because we're in this digital space, more often than not now, a recruiter's gonna email you versus calling you. It's unfortunate, but that's where we've moved, right? And so it's super, super, super important that when you apply to a position that you're also checking your junk mail. Um, when we look at exa an example, the organization that I work for, if you have a spam filter on there, my email is gonna go right to your junk folder, right? Now, if you're a good candidate, in most cases, why am I emailing you? Of course you're a good candidate. I'm gonna give you a follow-up phone call, perhaps I'll email you again, and hopefully it gets pushed through. Um, but it is something to be mindful of because there's some people that don't respond. Could be different reasons, but it is something to, uh, to think of. LinkedIn, I know that we have a LinkedIn session that, uh, that is coming up. If you have a valid and most importantly, an active LinkedIn profile, include it, sure. Put, put the link under here. Like I said, I, everything's digital now. So I can go and check out more of your, I guess, it would be an informal type of resume to your online community, your presence, your work history. I get to know a little bit more about you, maybe some posts that you share. Right? And that's another thing to be mindful of what we're sharing as well too, right? And I know we'll, uh, we have a really great speaker in mind for that as well too, so I, I'll, I'll leave, that, uh, leave that piece to her. But um, definitely good to include, again, if it's valid. If not, don't go home and, and rush into making a LinkedIn profile just for the sake of having one. Um, again, there needs to be intention. Why, why are you doing it, right? Uh, if you're applying to a position where your employer doesn't have LinkedIn, doesn't look at, link, doesn't look at LinkedIn, I mean, there might be a point at some time to join, but is it, is it relevant for this position? Probably not. What about, um, like, a, I have a one in Indeed. Yeah. So you can include, so that, that's a really great point. So if you do have an Indeed profile as well, too, um, depending on the organization, but for the most part, a lot of recruiters do have, and that's a great question, a lot of recruiters do have a profile on Indeed. Um, oftentimes for larger organizations, what will happen is, um, let's say I, I post something today. Um, typically it stays on our internal website, um, but Indeed job, what they do is they sift. 
they sift through a lot of a lot of the postings and they'll pull something and they'll put it on their website, right? So if you do have an Indeed profile versus a LinkedIn profile, I absolutely. Have people call me for merchandising. Let's yeah. say they're looking for merchandiser. Yeah. Um, I have yeah. Uh, it's companies perfect. call me and say, oh, you do merchandising. So and then that's how I got one yeah. interview. Yeah. No, that's and they I'm I'm really glad you brought me. that up. That's awesome. So that was good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's another one as well. I'm not too too familiar with other like particular websites. Um, obviously, you want to be mindful of you don't want to put your Facebook on there. No. <laughs> um, but no, but no. of but of course, your your Indeed or your LinkedIn are, are very good uh, yeah. good places. It's very important though to make sure that it's up to date and it's accurate and, and all of that good stuff though. Um, education. Um, so we've, we've touched base on project work and coursework and, and hopefully there's some relevance to um, some of the participants or people that, uh, that have come through Dress for Success here, but um, education. So this, this, like I said, can be a, a whole umbrella of different things, right? If you've studied abroad, if you have um, honors, if you've done any relevant coursework, um, there's particular situations, like I said, if you haven't finished a program ideally it's best not to not to share it um, unless there's some relevance to what you're applying to right so for example I'll give you a situation let's say I um, let's say I was taking an accounting course um, and then um, I had to take maternity leave and so I stopped going to school and I can go back and pick it up anytime. It's always going to be there for me, but right now it's not finished. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, half of the jobs that you apply to, half of the jobs anyways, um, when you look at the actual educational requirements, especially at entry level positions as well, a lot of the prerequisites would be a high school diploma only. So keeping that in mind, how much do you need to share? And we'll chat a little bit more about that as we go. But in particulars, um, with education, right? It all depends. What are you applying to? Why are you applying to it? Do you need to overshare if you're applying to be a cashier at Metro? All of this information? Probably not. It's great. It's, it's great information. Um, but again, 30 seconds. I want to buzz through one sheet. Don't they, uh, excuse me. Yeah. Don't they call uh, that sometimes like what you said with all of this? you know, in um, education and then you apply to like a retail or something. Yeah. Yeah, they don't need to, I mean, that's not what well, they want, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And again, it, know your audience. I, I do think that people that have completed those certificates or diplomas and everything like that, there is great value and great weight, weight in the um, in the coursework that they do leading up to their diploma. So for sure, I'm not saying don't put it on every resume, but if we look at the variations of it, right, depending on where you're applying, concentration in finance versus, you know, just business admin. Um, I find as a recruiter, it does get confusing as well too. Sometimes people put these dates. Does that mean you finished? Is that when you started? I, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know, it right? Be confusing. Yes. Right. So rule of thumb, usually when I see this, and I'm, I'll ask you in an interview, but when I see this, I look at this and think that you've completed it, right? Okay. So there needs to be full transparency, especially in positions that you're applying to where they have prerequisite for more than the high school. Um, you want to be as transparent and honest as possible in the interview process. It goes a lot a lot longer ways um, to have that transparency forthcoming and upright um, than it does later on to kind of go through and muddle through, you know, background checks and then find out you didn't actually get the prerequisite and now we're all back from square one and it's not a good experience for you and it's not a good experience for, um, for your employer or potential employer. Okay, so experience. So this is, this is the hard part, I find, I'll be honest. and, and happy to get feedback on this experience. So they're about accomplishment st statements, how to quantify your, your accomplishments, right? So um, what we need is an, so we need a verb, an action verb, context, result. So a really good example here would be, I helped fundraise. What did you fundraise for? How, 
did you did you show up to the food bank donation nine years ago and, and help fundraise? Did you actually raise a dollar? Did you pledge like did you pledge a dollar? Like what is the story behind this? What is the outcome behind this? Right. Um, so when we look at the the revised example of how we can kind of improve that bullet point on our resume to say fundraised. Yes, we fundraised six hundred dollars in donations to buy 20 new hockey jerseys for the school's team. Right. And so see the the difference and the shift in the impact and weight when you're reading that in 30 seconds. To me, looking at this helped fundraised, um, talked to students, um, did admin work. Can I? Um, yeah, can for I sure. Say something about Absolutely. Salvation Army, like the yeah. Kettle, um, campaign yeah well we raised a hundred and ninety thousand this year oh that's awesome so how would i would i even put that on there i don't think it's that relevant to the job yeah that so, i want to do something like something like just serving food at costco's yeah you know those little things that yeah just a, like a part-time little thing because i really like the fact that you choose your your days yeah yep yeah, yeah, work-life flexibility is yeah, yeah, one of the huge motivators for. for sure. So, okay, so let's think about this, right? So, so let's give the example that you use, which would be um, uh, you're helping. Kettle yep. a campaign. Right, exactly. Army. So let's think about that. So what you're doing is your, what's transferable in that? What would be something similar in that position that you did and you helped success and have success in that? Well, Commuting with people, talking. Exactly. I mean, communication with exactly. people, saying uh, thank you for your donations. We appreciate it yeah. from the Salvation Army. A hundred percent. And uh, thank you and Merry Christmas. Right, exactly, right? So <laughs> one, one, you're having a strong community presence. You're helping yes. create brand awareness, yes. right? You're, you are the first face of Salvation Army, right? When I, when I walk into a store, if somebody's outside and they have the kettle there, you are the face of that business for maybe that 10 seconds that I buzz in and buzz out, right? So yes. if you don't say hi to me or you don't acknowledge that I exist, I'm gonna remember that the next time that I buzz right. in and buzz out, right? So exactly. when we look at the transferable skills that you have, like whether you're a homemaker or whether you know, you've uh, done mostly charity work or whether you're a student, again, this mm -hmm. is something that we'll build upon, but when you boil it down, what are you doing in the job, yeah, right? Like you eye contact with the person, let him know that you're you're there. Thankful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So this might be a good example and a takeaway for maybe one of your bullet points, right? Um, that you could definitely work on, like work on through your resume as well too, as we go through the oh, rest of the workshop. Put it in my bullet point. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things on the. Maybe Absolutely. On the, maybe not on the first stop. Yeah. But like a little bit middle yeah okay yeah in terms of your work experience for okay. sure i think i think there is value in that and, and maybe for sure we can touch base on that a little more uh, maybe even one-to-one -one, i'd be happy to kind of chat with you through that too okay thanks so another example that i'll give which i didn't give the answer to is um, i provided excellent customer service to customers who came to the customer service desk <laughs> Too many customer service. I was just going to ask, why are you laughing? <laughs> why, are, why are we laughing, somebody? Yes, too many, too, repetition. too much. Repetition. Repetition, right? So repetition would be um, a really great example. Provide excellent customer service. What makes your customer service excellent? Is that because that's the adjective that you wanted to use? Or like, what are you doing at work? Um, Customer service desk, right? Obviously, this is taken out of context, but customer service desk, is that, is that what it's called? Is it actually a reception? Like, is yeah. it an office? Give me context, right? That's what I'm looking for. So I'm looking for action, context, results, right? So if we were to think about exa an example, a cashier at Metro, because I've, I've actually, I've done one of my many jobs <laughs> when I was in high school, I was a cashier at Metro. And I used to put on my resume, um, cash handled and serve customers uh, efficiently. Now, looking at this, right, like what else could I have added to dig a bit deeper for that recruiter or hiring manager to actually understand what I did or quantify the work that I did, right? So, okay, so let's think about this. Three hour shift, how many customers did I serve? Let's start with that. So, let's start with a number. Does it have to be 98 customers? No, it doesn't have to be that specific. But if you could give me an average of how many customers that you see in a shift, 
that's a great start, right? So, okay, so I, I saw an average of 120 customers a shift, right? Um, and uh, I, I would say out of those 120 customers, I had two returns, two returns, right? And so when we think about and we build out that story a little bit more about the customer service that you're, you're offering, two out of 120 customers returning items, it's not bad. That's really not that bad, right? And so what do the returns have to, to deal with? Is it produce, is it whatever, is it merchandise, right? So then there's a bit more of a story to that, but it's all about the context. And it's how you deliver it in one bullet point. So did anyone want to take a, take a stab at how to maybe kind of add some oomph to that, uh, that sentence? So when we look, I provided excellent customer service to customers who came to the customer service desk. Anybody want to try it? Do we want to take maybe like a minute or two? Kind of buzz around. Say again. Um, so the example is, I provided excellent customer service to customers who came to the customer service desk. And so what we're looking to do is, um, how can we quantify that and add value? So putting in perspective, if you are a, again, the cashier at Metro, right? how can we add some perspective? How can we add context? Again, it's an example, so be creative, but sure. Met expectations of... It's hard, it is hard. It is really, really hard to do. What about how, you know, half a dozen customers per hour when they brought back products to return that they weren't happy with? Yeah, yeah, I like that, I like that. And then in your next bullet point about those customers who came and complained, maybe you can talk about that, right? So then we're kind of building out like, what do we actually do? Yes, we cash handle, yes, we deal with customers, but like, what are you actually doing in your job? Like, wh what are you doing? I know the, the role, but what do you do that makes a difference in your job? If you were not to show up today, and if Reagan were to come in and fill in for your shift, what is something that maybe I wouldn't do or something, what would go unmissed or missed at that point in time if, if I came in and filled in for your shift, right? So this is the hard part. This is the really hard part. And so this takes a lot of practice. Like I told you, I worked at Metro, I worked at Toast and Jam. I had a number of different fields um, and I really didn't know what I was doing. So I just, again, I took all of these really short tidbits, put them in a resume and sent them off. I think that's a great idea. When you're brainstorming, when you're trying to write a story, when you're trying to do an essay or a project for school, when you're trying to do something like that, just write it all out. Write it as is, write what you know, and then come back to it and look at it. And then you might find sentences like this. Hopefully you don't. Um, but if you do, then you can stop and think, ah, I remember we had this conversation with Reagan, and she told me that this was too many, too many customer service. Uh, words there. There's too much rep repetition. Any questions about this piece? This is like really the meat and the potatoes of your resume. Any questions so far about this piece? Yeah. Maybe not specifically this piece, but sometimes people worry about gaps yep. in experience yep. in school. Yeah. Can you cover that somehow? Sure. Yeah. Or yeah, absolutely. So I've seen a couple of variations of this, like looking at resumes and doing interviews. Um, one I've seen, um, for example, um, uh, worked as a, an office administrative assistant from 2017 to 2019, because we all know what happened in 2019, right? COVID. Um, and then 2022, I get a job, right? There is that gap. As a recruiter, I'm trying to piece together the story. I don't want to assume it's because of COVID because there was still a lot of people who still worked. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna make any assumptions. Very similar to the availability piece that we touched base on earlier. It is, again, you don't have to overshare, you share what you're comfortable with, but I've also seen candidates who have kind of filled in the blanks for me, so that when I go in into an interview, I already know, I already know I'm up to speed, I know what we're talking about, we don't have to spend a lot of time on that issue. Um, so for example, somebody could say, um, you know, took time out of the office for mat leave. Again, whatever you're comfortable with sharing, because your information is yours, right? So if you're not comfortable sharing that, then that's fine, but be prepared to answer that question, not once, but probably two or three times throughout the entire process. 
right? So having a good and clear understanding or explanation of why you took that time out. Maybe you homeschooled your kid because um, the school's closed. <laughs> and so somebody had to do it, right? Um, there could be a number of different, of different reasons. Maybe you moved somewhere and you couldn't find a job for a really long time. That, it makes sense, right? It makes sense in the resume. Um, maybe you worked a couple of odd jobs here and there and you didn't want to put them on the resume because you stayed there for a couple of weeks. I don't find anything wrong with that, but I find knowing the story, like I said, being transparent up front, it, it does help throughout the entire process. It does help with the consistency. So to answer your question, again, there is no right or wrong. Um, I just find the transparency piece is really helpful. Did, sorry, did somebody have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a couple of them. So yeah. How much white lying can you, like, you know, we all kind of exaggerate. Yep. Yeah. Um, is that like, can you not, is that a, a good thing to do or not? That's what I'm to do. No, that's a great, that's a great and very honest question. Um, so question was basically kind of fudging things a little bit or maybe a, a white liar and enhancement. <laughs> An enhancement. Again, there's that, that change, right? Enhancement mind, of, no, I don't mind at all. Go ahead. Um, enhancement of, of what we do in, at work, right? Out of all the experiences that I've had looking at resumes, right, I see something on paper and then I go to interview and it's not consistent. Somebody will write something on a piece of paper and say, and I see this often, I'm very um, proficient with Excel and Microsoft Word and PowerPoint, <laughs> right? Okay, so what, what if in the interview, right, what if they give you a situation? What if they ask you a technical recruiter question, how do you apply this or how do you do this or how, how do you do this function on Excel and you don't have an answer for it, mm -hmm. right? And then right from there, your credibility is all gone. So I would say, you know, in terms of embellishments, I would be very, very careful with how we do that. Um, like I said earlier in, in quantifying, right? You don't need to, to know the exact number of customers you serve. That's fine. I have no problem with that. It doesn't need to be, like I said, 98, you can say 100, 120, right? But if I say I serve 300 customers in, you know, two hours, uh, like I'm looking at the market, I live in Kingston, I'm working at Kingston Metro, there's like nine metros in Kingston, did I really serve 300 customers in two hours? Probably not, right? Yeah? Um, is it true that they have, like, for large companies, there's actually a program, they kind of just scan your resume through and it's and it picks up on keywords? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, there are some organizations that do have something like that, that basically grab keywords like strategy, customer service. Mm -hmm. the resume too, right? Not just like anywhere. Just there, there, are, there definitely are some um, that do that. I can tell you right now, I'm looking at all the resumes that I receive. I can't obviously speak to other organizations, but I do know that that does exist. Um, so that, that, that can lead into kind of our, our next pieces here. So do's and don'ts, um, and I just wanna be mindful of your time as well, because I can appreciate uh, we're getting close here. So resumes, do, do's and don'ts. So fonts do matter, they really do. Um, it sounds very stickler and, and particular, um, but I find it very difficult for me to get through a whole resume that looks like this like you're shouting at me, and everything is as equally important as your name, as it, as it is to uh, references available upon request. I don't need that, right? Um, exactly, there's some very nice like common fonts, I'll say, like a lot of organizations use. Arial would be one of them. Times New Roman, you'll, you'll mostly see in like a school setting probably, um, but again, they're safe, they're comfortable. Um, spelling or grammar errors, this is, this is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. I have seen resumes that have come through and they've saved them as a PDF, which is really nice, and uploaded them. And um, they had uploaded the edited version of it that showed on the side all of their comments and corrections that had to be made. And it was all in red. Yeah, very important. It was great that the attempt was there, but we need to be very, very mindful, right? Because that 30 seconds is everything. You spell the company name wrong, mm. 
right? And, and again, you know what? Mistakes happen. There's probably been emails that I've sent where, you know, I've, I've made a spelling mistake. We're all human beings, but for the 30 seconds, this is something that you want to double, triple check. Um, when we look at, uh, at the positions, so like we said earlier, one size fits all. It's not. It's not. Do you know what this means? This is the part where I said, it's, if you're not frustrated, you're not doing it right. Unfortunately, I have bad news for you. <laughs> you need to update your resume to where you're applying to. You need to tailor it, right? Like, like we said, as a very small piece, uh, a micro piece was the um, education. Something very small that you can change. It takes two seconds, but it's worth doing. Um, the pages. <laughs> the pages. So personally, personally, when we're looking at 30 seconds and we're looking at four pages, what are we applying to? Why, why are we applying to it, right? We're coming full circle. If you have 10 plus years of experience in something, I would say it's reasonable if, to have two pages. If you have under, of ten, under 10 years in something, I would say stick, stick to a page, right? The best, the best thing would be one page at best. If you can't keep it to a page, a page and a half. If you're pushing two pages, look at the information that you're putting in. Um, at the beginning of this presentation, I showed you optional optional pieces, right? If you're repeating yourself, customer service, customer service, customer service, you can probably take some of that stuff out. Um, so include your full address, we've covered that. References, we've covered that. And uh, describing past roles, so we did cover this as well. We don't want you to describe your past roles. We want you to communicate what you've accomplished. Meaningful metrics using relevant verbs. What did you do? Quantify it. How do you know that you were successful? How do you know that you had excellent customer service? Does your company send out um, anonymous customer feedback surveys? Do you get those results back? Do you have an eight out of 10 for the entire month of all the customer feedback scores that you have? That's excellent customer service. Um, acronyms, so you wanna be mindful, right? Know your audience. Again, intention, know where you're playing. Know yourself, self-awareness. Know your audience, right? So if you've if you um, are studying nursing, for example, and you're going to apply to a customer service job, and you're using all of these acronyms from your science-related field, that's great, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I would love to, but again, 30 seconds, right? Maybe we can chat more about it in an interview. Um, but again, if you're asking yourself about the acronyms, probably take them out. This one, this is huge. Um, apply online and in person. Not a lot of people are doing this anymore because everything is online. You know what, you, the, worst, the worst thing that you could do is drop off your resume in person, have a great chat with the manager, and they'll say, you know what, I'm really glad you dropped off your, your resume, but you do need to apply online. What is wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, I got an interview with, um, with the lady at Costco's. I was at Costco, she goes, do you have an, um, a resume with you? Yeah. I said, no, but I would. I could come back tomorrow with it. Yeah. And she said, okay, well, Thursday's a good day to come in. Yeah. So I'm coming Perfect. in now this Thursday. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Exactly. Because she said it was a good day. And yeah. I got to, I said to her, well, I got to meet you. Yeah. At least I got to meet you. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Yeah. No, so, that's really good. Yeah, now I know her name and I know she's the event planner. Yeah. My manager? Yeah. No, that's that's perfect, right? Again, not a lot of people are doing this anymore. Yeah, yeah, it it good. really it really makes a whole a whole difference when you're looking at the mass the mass applications that we're getting versus, you know, maybe I don't know somebody that works for that company, but how can I find somebody that does? Oh, there's a shoppers drug mart down the street and I want to be a cashier there. Perfect. I'm going to buzz in and see if the manager's yeah. there. They're not there. Let me talk to the cashier for a bit, right? Then that way, when I call for a follow-up, I can say, hey, um, I, I talked to Tim on Saturday. I, I knew you weren't in, but I'd love to you know, talk to you a little bit about the position or posting that you have. Could I ask Yeah. You, so, oh. should you ask me about the um, um, res um, references available on request, just not even include nope. it? And just in this, because you know that you'll be bringing them to... The yeah, half the time people don't ask. Um, half the time, and if they do, they'll like they'll remind you. They'll ask you for it. I 
to me, you should always have at least three core references. Again, not your Uncle Steve, but you should have three core references. Keep them in your back pocket, make sure their information is up to date. Um, but personally, I don't find, to me, that's a, that's a space filler, which is fine. There's nothing wrong. If you wanna put it, put it, put it there. I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you, again, it's not a one size fits all thing. If you want to put it, if, if there's something in the job description that calls for that, then for sure. But we're looking at one page, right? One page. Um, if they ask for references, then, then you can say, yeah, here, here, here you go, here's three. There's no delays in that response, right? Because you have them on hand. So, I mean, great question. Like I said, I, it's not a one size fits all, but um, it, it, is, it is dependent. The interview, and this goes back to what we said at the beginning. Everything about your process in terms of talent acquisition, it starts before you apply. It starts before you put together your resume. Um, you know, it starts, it starts with you, right? So it, it's determined on your ability basically to tell your story and your preparedness. Um, if you don't prepare and you think you can just go in and wing it because you've worked in the de dentistry field for 20 plus years and you know, maybe they throw you a curveball question or maybe there's been changes in the last couple of years, it's gonna show. It's, it's gonna show in the behavioral questions that are asked. Um, so professional goals. Um, so these are things that you wanna think of. This is a very popular question. Where do you see yourself in the next three to five years? If it's not, your answer is not with that company, don't tell them that. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you that right now. Um, when I'm looking at hiring somebody, again, this is, again, simply like I'm biased for any department. I wanna know that there's longevity there, right? Okay, so you're applying to be part-time today. Do we offer management positions? Do we offer internship positions? Do we have other departments? Maybe you could work in HR, or maybe you could work um, in the deli, or you could work somewhere else. Like, I want to know that you're gonna stay here. We're not gonna pay, commit, train, all of this good stuff for you just to leave us. We don't want you to leave, we want you to stay. Um, so take your time, ask for clarification or rephrasing if necessary. At the beginning of this, I told Linda Ann that I was nervous. She told me being nervous is good, and this goes back to the mantras and the quotes, but being nervous is good because it shows you care, right? Um, caring is really great, and I can read nerves very easily over the phone. It doesn't take a lot to recognize that. Take your time. If something doesn't make sense to you, please, please, please ask them to, to stop, rephrase. They will. They will find another way. It's a conversation. It's, it's not a one-way street as much as you think that it is. It's not. Um, in some cases, you could be interviewing them for the position, right? You could have, you could have a job and you could just be you know, browsing the market and, and your different opportunities. Um, so take your time, please. Research the compensation. This one is a huge one. Um, yeah. This one's a huge one. Um, Glassdoor is a, is a good example, but please use that with a grain of sand, or a gra grain of sand, <laughs> grain of salt. I'm saying that because I came back from vacation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm saying that with a grain of salt or sand, whatever, whatever you uh, fancy there, but um, research the compensation. So if we're looking at minimum wage now in Ontario, it's 1550. Um, and some companies are paying above minimum wage for entry level positions. On Indeed jobs, Indeed jobs would be one of them, Glassdoor would be the other, where the employer has to put some type of range. That's a good place to literally pop in Google, hey, uh, Google, uh, an example, o office admin assistant for X dentistry office, right? Anybody that's used um, Indeed, uh, whether it's the employer or if it's a candidate to give a review of their previous company because that's how Indeed works, you're gonna find that information there. Again grain of salt because who, who provided that information, right? Was it a recruiter and they didn't want to show the entire scope but they had to put something in? Or was it a person that left the organization that had like 20 years of experience and you have two, right? So we need to, we need to be mindful of that. Um, this one, very, very important. You can always ask recruiters about salary bands before you answer that question. So a question that'll often get, answer, or often get asked is what is your salary expectation for this position? Do you, you, you wanna make sure that you've done your research. You can say, you know what, based on what I've seen, that, you know, this is consistent with what's, what's online. Um, however, what is the salary band? Like, what does this position pay? There is nothing wrong with asking that question. I find um, a lot of the time we get really nervous and we, we don't think we're allowed to ask and we say, oh, you know, whatever the company's gonna offer. If better is possible, good is not enough, right? So know, know your worth. 
I'm not going to go in there knowing the top of the salary band is $80,000 a year and ask for that when I have one year experience. <laughs> Probably not. That, that doesn't make sense. Um, but, you know, you only know what you know and having information doesn't hurt and asking questions doesn't hurt. The worst they're going to tell you is, you know what, unfortunately we don't disclose that. However, here's where we start. Better, more information than what you had when they were asking for that answer. Memorable candidates. So applied online and in person, we've chatted about that. Employee referral or, and or el other relevant networks. Look at the programs that we're doing here. Look at, the, look at the awesome people around the room right now. Look at all of the different connections that are here today, um, as well as the people outside of this room, right? It, unfortunately, it is all sometimes a little bit of a game about who you know um, that can help propel you, right? Um, like I said, if you don't know anybody, then, then go to the store, drop off your resume, meet somebody, um, make that impression, be personable, be prepared, ask meaningful questions at the end of the interview. So this is something that I love. Um, for me, it's a little anticlimactic. When somebody doesn't ask me questions, I just spend all day asking you questions. Ask me something, please, please. I wanna, cha I wanna change up the, uh, the story. I wanna change up the narrative. I wanna answer something. Maybe, maybe it's good feedback for the recruiter. Maybe I didn't provide you enough information, right? We're always all kind of learning and growing. It's a great experience either way. Follow-up thank you email and phone call. This is endlessly class, like classy. I love it. I think that you, know, you can never go wrong with saying thank you. I would be mindful with how you ask for feedback or how quick you ask for the feedback because there should be a standard process with how quickly feedback comes back to you. But I've, I've clicked the phone with candidates before and I've had an email by the end of the business day. Hey, you know what, thank you so much. Sometimes they've put like a little emoji or something and you know what, depending on who the recruiter is and the rapport that you had in the interview, maybe, maybe read the virtual room. But for me, I love that. I think that's great. I think that's, that's personable. That sets you aside, right? And I do, for me anyways, as a recruiter, I do forward those to the hiring manager when I'm done to say, you know what, maybe they aren't the best fit for a manager experience, but can we find them something else? Sorry, did I, uh, I want to know yeah. about the emoji. So is that a good thing or not? <laughs> I didn't quite so, that. so uh, I guess emoji or like, um, like a virtual e-card or something, like a snippet of something to say thank you. Oh, okay. I would say be, be mindful of, you know, of what yeah. you're sharing with them. Um, but if it's, you know, something off of Google that just says thanks and it has a bunch of flowers around it, like I've gotten, I've received that before and that's gone a long way. Okay. Um, so that's, that's just something nice and it adds a bit of personality too rather than, than just the email. It shows me, oh, okay, like maybe this person likes tulips. I don't know, maybe they're born in May. Like I want to know a little bit more. Um, <laughs> So unfortunately, we didn't have time for the exercise. Again, being especially mindful of all the lovely people that came here to, uh, to do and hear the workshop. I know we're a few minutes over time. Thank you so much. Yes. This was amazing. Oh, thank you. I think it was absolutely oh, wonderful. Good. You covered so much so well. Oh.